So you'll see that you're at a certain table, that's number table number one, two, three, and so you all know that there's a number at your table. There are corresponding uh, whiteboards around the room, and so we're going to ask you to kind of get up and, and use this whiteboard to do a little introduction of each other to each other. Um, so the idea here is that you should all just kind of introduce yourselves to your group and talk about who you are and, and the work that you do. And the, the challenge here is using the whiteboard. We'd like you to find the things that you all do in common in support of women's health, okay? So you all represent a wide swath of organizations, but I think we're all here united for this purpose of reducing um, uh, negative birth outcomes. And so all of you have something, to have a role to play in that. And so we'd like you to use this whiteboard and figure that out. Um, so that is your challenge. We're gonna take about seven minutes to do this. It'll be pretty quick and then we'll get going with the rest of the presentation. So there's markers um, at each of the boards, and so I would encourage you to you know, find someone to write it down, and then we'd also like to have someone report back. So think about who's gonna do the report back as well. Okay, thank you, so just cluster by your uh, whiteboards here. <laughs> Common, uh, our professions, of course, lead us all to care and health care. But uh, the, the big thing that came out that we feel we all had in common and could really speak from a common ground is care coordination of women and children. Incredibly important. Thank you very much, Group 1. Group 2, can you all speak to the things that you all have in common in support of women's health? I don't think we, we really finished our conversation, but Jean pointed out that we are all women <laughs> taking care of women. So, Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Group number three. You all were busy over there, right? That was your whiteboard. So we could talk to you about the things you found in common. Uh, we also didn't totally finish our discussion. We were still talking and meeting everyone. But one of the things that we seem to all have a lot in common with is we have different agencies from providers to insurance companies at our tables, but all of us kind of felt like we all provide case management in some way, shape, or form to women. Excellent. Excellent. And we're going to be keeping track of this, too. This is going to play into future sessions. Um, group five, who would like to speak about... <laughs> uh, group five, when we all sort of discuss what we do, we basically all do the care. We, the only thing that's not at our table is someone who does like OB uh, and GYN services, but we, we do case management, we have birthing classes, we do adolescents, which covers peds, the kids and the mom, we do family planning, uh, you know, where people had experience with family planning, uh, HIV AIDS services, so we kind of doing that already. So we just need somebody over here who's an OB <laughs> You have interpregnancy care. That's it. Table five. <laughs> Table six. Who would like to speak? I'm representing okay. Hi. For table six, we found that we had in common was the reproductive life plan services, as well as we provide um, services to teenagers, as well as behavioral health screenings, referrals, as well as um, treatments, STT screenings, um, and treatment and evaluation. So we had a lot in common. Wow, great. There was some planned seating too, just so you all know. <laughs> um, table four, I'm so sorry, I didn't count properly. So who would like to report back for table four? Oh, or, sure. Um, we are, uh, for the most part, a lot of, most of us are doing service coordination. Same thing that we've just been saying. Education um, came up and um, referral services as well. Excellent. Thank you. All right, table six we did. And table seven, over here. So um, we looked at what we had in common and some things that came up with the idea of like, we're all working on behavioral health topics and how that really could link to social health. Um, we're a lot driven by data and so the data is really something that unifies us. Um, we have the LPHI funder and then we just talked about how WIC really could be a point of touch, a point of contact and referral to linking a lot of um, all these services and our mothers. And so the idea of coordinating the services or just how gluing all these services could be, um, how we really, I guess, link each other. We all interested in connecting 
and helping our moms, and then just in general, they give passion. We're all passionate about the work we're doing right now. Oh yeah, and also we have some MDs who are interested in linking policy and prevention. So that's um, another commonality. Thank you very much. I think the concept of glue and how to link all these things together will be coming up for us. Um, table number nine, who would like to speak? This is me. Yeah. Okay, basically, a lot of what we heard in the room already, but we're looking at a continuum of uh, network of services at this table already, and primary care, the whole continuum of, of women's health from prevention to intervention, prevention, QI programs, care coordination, outreach, maternal health, multi-levels. We're looking at state, we're looking at um, state entities, nonprofits, uh, some representation from LPHI. I think so much of what we have here is primed for this project that we're talking about right now. So I think we have the networks, we have the referral systems. I think we're pretty much primed with that and looking forward to moving forward with this process. Thank you. Very much. Very strong. Um, and so this table here, did I already do table C? But this is table eight. Okay, we're all over the map here. Who would like to speak um, from table eight? Oh, come on. Come on. All right. Um, we uh, realized that we had in common because we were chatting, chatting, chatting. Evaluation, adolescent health, policy, innovation. High, working with high risk populations, reproductive health, and manualization. Manual and collaboration. Great, thank you so much for participating in that. And I think, as Carla was saying, you all, we have an incredible amount of skill sets in the room that we're going to be using a lot in the into today and then in future sessions. So I'm going to turn it back over to Carla. Great, so I just want to um, move on to our, our next thing, which is that Michelle Alito is here. We're really honored to have her here. She's from the Louisiana Department of Health and Hospitals, and she is the director of the Louisiana Birth, sorry, Deputy Director of the Louisiana Birth Outcomes Project, and she's going to speak to us today about what's going on in Louisiana and New Orleans um, and give us some, some statistics. Great, good morning. I am actually the deputy director, um, which I'm still is still a job um, that is an honor for me. Uh, but the director of the Birth Outcomes Initiative for the state of Louisiana is Dr. Rebecca Gee, and she's um, in the back. Wave to everybody. Um, and so, what I uh, was asked to come and talk to you about today was the problem, um, which I think I, I mean I've been living in and breathing this for a few years now. Some of you in the room have been breathing it, living and breathing it for a lifetime. Um, so I think for some of you, this is um, old news and you could probably school me on what the problem is. And for some of you, um, this is going to be maybe new information or information that's put in possibly a different frame, um, which is, I think, one of the reasons we're all here today. So our birth outcomes uh, for the state of Louisiana, it's no surprise, are not good. Um, We've known this for a long time, but the unfortunate news is that they're not really getting any better. You know, as one of um, the presenters said this morning, the national rates in infant mortality, some national indicators are improving, um, but in the state of Louisiana, we still are stuck pretty close to the bottom um, in things like preterm birth, low birth weight, and infant mortality. Um, and what I did here, because I know that you all in this room today are primarily concerned uh, with Orleans Parish. Um, I wanted you to see uh, where Orleans stacks up against the state rankings um, and rates for these really important indicators. And one thing that was discussed already, but what I learned and what was news to me is that I think infant mortality is often discussed as a sentinel measure for um, society's health. And when we really dig into improving birth outcomes, we find that there are a lot of causes for infant mortality that we can't necessarily um, intervene on as easily as we can uh, for preterm and low birth weight. And of course, so many babies that, are, that die were born low birth weight. Um, but what we really look at um, and have looked at in the state initiative is improving preterm birth and low birth weight. So one of the um, really important uh, indicators for uh, interconception health and for birth outcomes is um, sexually transmitted infection. And um, we can see here that we are pretty um, uh, 
I was gonna use a word I didn't wanna use. Uh, we're not doing well with uh, sexually transmitted infection um, in Orleans Parish in particular. This is an area where um, maybe on some birth outcomes or some other measures uh, statewide, Orleans isn't in the bottom, but for sexually transmitted infection, Orleans Parish um, really is not doing great in chlamydia and gonorrhea particularly. Um, so this is from our pregnancy risk assessment monitoring survey that we do out of the Bureau of Family Health. Um, and this is really, um, while it's not able to be broken down by parish, um, it really is an important survey for um, talking to women directly and, and asking them about their um, pregnancy experience um, and their interconception, preconception experiences. So you'll see here, um, and you have this in your packet, so I won't run through every one, but just to give you a sense of um, so many of the things that we look at for preconception health, um, that in the state of Louisiana we have a lot of work to do. Unintended pregnancy, um, using birth control, um, and you can see that only 30% um, of women received any uh, preconception counseling. Um, another very important um, issue that we look at is pregnancy spacing. We know that that's one of the areas that um, if you are going to improve particularly um, uh, preterm birth that you have adequate pregnancy spacing which is really where family planning and contraception comes into play the most. Um, and as was said this morning, um, opportunity for impact, one of the things um, that really uh, helped get uh, the state of Louisiana leadership on board very early on, if the moral imperative didn't catch them, was the financial imperative that we in the state, all of us in the room, um, are really paying for poor outcomes. And so if this was a business, um, we would be out of business. And uh, so that helped us leverage certainly funding to be moved towards this area to say, what can we do upstream to invest so that we're not paying for poor outcomes at the time of birth and also um, throughout life. So the framework that we really, um, I think you'll hear more and more about this today, that the approach that we took very early on was the life course approach. And that is, if you really want to impact birth outcomes, you need to impact um, the health of families, particularly the health of women, before they give birth um, and before they get pregnant, or before they even think of getting pregnant. Um, and so Dr. Liu really um, is the uh, leader on this uh, theory. Now he is the head of the Health Resources and Services Administration and is helping really um, HRSA programs and other federal programs to get on board with this notion. Um, and really it's about prevention and education. So the interventions that we tried um, for birth outcomes were um, some of these things are already being done on this continuum of interventions to improve birth outcomes um, at various you know, at various levels of investment um, and expertise across our state. We have very strong home visitation programs. Um, we had a lot to do, oh, I forgot, no, I put the right circle. We did, um, we wanted to look across the state at our um, smoking cessation and behavioral health screening and intervention for women, um, focusing on um, perinatal care, prenatal care in hospitals. Um, and labor and delivery and looking at um, quality improvement in that area. And also, which is the reason we're all here today, looking at care coordination, case management, um, and interconception care, particularly at women at high risk. But if you live in the state of Louisiana, especially if you are a woman of color, you are at high risk. So if the unfortunate story there is that um, disparities and just living in Louisiana, as you could see from the first slides, puts you at most likely risk. So this was something that we didn't have to look um, very hard to find our target at risk population, particularly when 70% of our births are paid for by Medicaid. We know we're dealing with um, a underinsured population who um, probably isn't seeking medical care regularly um, and probably is living in poverty, has a lot of um, the social determinants of health um, not working um, on their side. So what we did um, in July 2012 was get a waiver uh, that was incorporated, which I know many of you are familiar with, into the 1115 um, NOKI demonstration waiver to do interpregnancy care for women at high risk. Um, and we really focused on those women who had already had a preterm and low birth weight baby, knowing that, especially the evidence base, um, is the strongest for intervening for subsequent poor birth outcomes in this population. 
So um, this was a four-county um, interpregnancy care waiver, um, definitely modeled after um, Grady Memorial Hospital program, and Healthy Start Case Management um, is where we um, focus to um, provide case management, interconception health, reproductive life planning for women um, in the program. And um, as of now, we have 47 women enrolled um, in the program through Healthy Start and through Medicaid. Um, and I think, just to say one more thing about that, um, now that I have, uh, I know I have two whole minutes, I'm going to use them, um, is that we have learned a lot uh, through that program about finding women, um, what women want and need, and we're continually learning um, more and more about this, you know, what we call in, you know, the government buildings a target population. The target population and the, st the statistics are people and their women and their families in our communities. And um, statistics can tell you a lot, but what really tells you a lot is when you actually talk to these women and talk to the families and work um, and go door to door in these communities. So um, I know that especially those of you in primary care settings know the challenges of um, reaching families and bringing them into our establishments, but I would, I would caution all of us um, and challenge all of us to really think about what are we doing to go to the, into the communities um, in, in a right way, in a respectful way, um, and really reach um, the families that we say that we are trying to serve. Um, and I think that's one of the lessons that I have learned um, has touched my heart in the work that we've done with Healthy Start um, and in uh, New Orleans. And um, it was a big lesson for me, and I think that it should be a lesson as we proceed um, to really look at um, the best, uh, most respectful way to talk about the clients that we're trying to serve and how can we really reach them instead of asking them um, to come and reach us. So moving forward, um, the Bureau of Family Health, which is my new home in the Office of Public Health, um, I am over our family planning and teen pregnancy prevention programs along with a wonderful team. Um, and really, one of the things that we're looking at a lot is the um, impact of racism and um, what are the, the um, you know, we, we know what the health disparities are. Um, they're stark. But um, what, are, what is causing those disparities and what can we really do about it as a health department? Um, and so we're really doing that through our family planning, maternal child health, and our interconception care work in the Bureau. Um, and also um, the DHH Office of Medicaid, which um, Dr. Rebecca Gee is now the medical director of, thank goodness, it's great news, um, for family planning um, and women's health advocates. Uh, we have an adult quality CMS um, grant, which is going to continue a lot of the work that we have done. Um, and so this is really what we've looked at. I sort of think of our interconception care work as a spider. Um, and it sort of started in this one little place, but we're trying to thread it through everything and make it not a pilot program or an isolated program, but something um, that is just a way that people do business in caring about these um, women and families. Um, so that is being done through our managed care plans and then taking a really hard look at our Take Charge Family Planning Program um, and seeing what we can do to really bolster that and make sure that the women who are eligible are enrolled um, and that they're getting quality um, accessible services. Um, and so I think I will end there. Um, oh, the one more thing, I think I have 30 seconds. The one more thing I was asked to touch on um, was that, um, was how or um, in what way did intersecting with the primary care environment um, pose a challenge or an opportunity for us doing this work so far? Um, and really, um, I think what, what um, Joan Wyken and I learned early on in going around and visiting many of the um, clinics in the area and what Rebecca and I have learned in visiting OBs um, is that it's just a, it's a very um, siloed system. And so a lot of the work that we talk about is making those connections, and I talked to Maria about this this morning, is just making sure that all the programs um, that we see as siloed um, are really working for the families and the women that we serve, and they can't make those connections because we haven't set up a great system for them to do that. So um, I think a lot of the lessons learned with um, working with primary care is just figuring out um, how do we all bring the best of ourselves and our expertise, um, our government funding, our lack of funding, um, to bring to bear on making these systems work um, for the families that we serve. And I don't think that it's that primary care doesn't want to do the right thing. 
um, but we get the outcomes um, for the systems that we have designed. So I think it's just acknowledging some of the barriers there um, and just doing that education and um, making, continuing to make the case for the importance because if we don't um, make women and families healthier, we do um, pay for that down the line. Um, and those families can't reach um, the, their you know, biggest potential. So I will stop there and thank you all for having me. And it's just, um, again, um, what Liz said this morning is just really inspiring to see all of you here. <laughs>